Good evening. I'm excited to get to do this this evening because I'm feeling prepared, and that's not always a trait that I have. So um, I'm hoping that this goes well. But I'm grateful to everyone for their presence this evening. I'm grateful for um, your interest in God's Word, your interest in our study of it together. Um, I hope to look at some things that uh, may start out as familiar, but uh, may eventually look at things in a way that, that perhaps we haven't always before, or um, at least remind us of if we haven't recently. I've got a couple goals for, for this lesson. Um, I'm hoping to, to do this more often because I have a, a category in my notes which I have, which is sermon ideas. And whenever I'm listening to a Bible class or maybe someone else speak, I'll jot something down in there. And I've got some in there that I'm not sure yet how to do, but they're going to be a little bit tricky. And I have a goal for myself, which is I want to start doing this with a little bit more boldness. I feel like before, maybe I've picked safe topics, easier topics. I want to try to make this harder on myself. But I have another goal, and that is to make a request of all of you. When I listen to sermons, I take notes, and I've gotten into the habit recently of taking notes in two colors. And I'll take notes in black, and I'll take notes in red. And when I write something in red, that means I'm taking notes critically. I'm taking notes in red when I think, I'm not sure I would have put it that way. Or I don't know if this also needs to be considered. And I will tell you that in the last three months or so, almost every sermon gets red. So red does not mean it's a bad sermon. My, I give my dad red ink. I've given Brace red ink. John got red ink. Uh, Aaron got red ink. Nobody's safe. But my request to you is whether you do it in brackets on the side of your page, if you do it in red ink, or if you're one who listens and notes things in your head, put down red ink if you find it. I'm inviting everyone to test what I have to say as in 1 John 4.1, test every spirit. And you all are very kind and you all are very supportive and complimentary, but what I would love to hear from all of you is your criticism. Uh, and I would welcome that because I'm learning at this, I'm working at this, and all of us are. And if we can share with one another the ways in which we, we find areas to improve, the collective benefit is so much stronger than the work of one person studying on their own. So please have those red pens ready as you listen, or figuratively ready. This evening I wanted to talk about a, a topic, a concept that exists in the passage that was read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and that is this way of escape. We read this passage, and it's a, it's a message of hope that we often comfort ourselves with. We are all familiar with temptation. We know the struggles that temptation poses to us, and it feels like it never goes away. We, we live our lives imagining, one day I'll be mature enough that this won't be an issue for me anymore. One day I'll be far enough along that I won't be tempted by that anymore. I won't, I won't fall to those same problems anymore. And I think those of us who have had much more experience than I have will readily say that that's not the case. That as life continues on, we realize that temptation is a never-ending fact of life. So what do we do about it? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the question is not what do we do about it, it's what has God done about it. And that is providing the way of escape. I wanted to begin this evening with just a bit of an examination on the, the subject of temptations and trials, and then we're going to devote the rest of the time to thinking about what are the different ways that God enables us to escape temptations and trials. And I said temptations and trials because, as Brace pointed out in his comments on Wednesday, I thought for a second that I might need a rewrite, but um, the beauty of God's Word is that multiple people can pull from the same passage and, and draw different parallels and we're not double speaking, we're not talking over one another. Um, it's it's complementary, not, not contradictory or, com or competitive. But as Brace rightly pointed out, the Greek word here that's translated temptation can rightly be translated temptation, trial, or even test. Um, God can be the source of tests. God can be the source of trials, just as Satan can be the source of testing and trials. So really, and throughout this lesson, though we focus on temptation, which is more of like a malicious uh, begging us to sin, encouraging us to sin. We're going to talk about that, but also keep in mind that 
simply trials, simply barriers and difficulties in life are temptations in their own right. So what is this force of temptation? What is this force, this, this feeling that, that attacks us, this, this prompting? The verse that John read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says that it has overtaken us. It, it runs us over. It, it buries us down. And it's, the other thing that the verse points out is that it is common. There is no temptation that is not common. It's a certainty in life. Um, and that temptation can be a direct call to sin, direct encouragement to sin. Come and commit this sin with us. Um, and that is best exemplified, I would say, in Satan's malicious intent. Satan, when he was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, he was directly inviting the Savior to violate his mission, to violate his purpose. Come and, and declare yourself to be king of this world, ruler of this world, and take advantage of your power. So uh, we may think that direct calls to sin may seem rare going about in day-to-day -day life. It, it seems strange that someone would just grab us on the street and say, hey, you want to do meth? You know, but look, it exists. And maybe you've missed a lot of those uh, opportunities. If so, I'd say you're fortunate. Um, but if we find ourselves in scenarios where we're being directly and explicitly invited to sin, there are probably multiple warning signs that we missed along the way to get into that situation. Um, but the good news is that you have it in your power to stop there. Um, just because you've had that direct interpretation, it doesn't mean that it's the end all. Temptation can also be indirect. It can be an encouragement to fulfill a perceived need. And this is particularly true in how the world tries to share its wisdom. The world will try to tell us that there are lots of ways that you have needs and that there's ways that you can enjoy those things. There's lots of ways that you can express yourself and, and live out your life the way you want to, and you'll be better for it, you'll be happier for it, and you'll have uh, better fullness of life. And this is, again, a form of temptation. It can be many ways in which the world wants to sell to us that, that our own desires are chief, that our own desires are paramount when indeed they're, they're disguised, and they're dressed up as something good. They're dressed up as something helpful. Temptation can take the form of feeling as though we are surrounded by wrongdoing. And so, where is the hope? Where is, where is God when the world is so uh, distraught around us, so surrounded with evil? In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 9, it speaks of Lot when he lived in the city of Sodom. Verse 7 through 9 of 2 Peter 2 says, And if he rescued righteous Lot, he's speaking of the context here, he's, he's pointing out God's justice. He didn't spare angels when they sinned. He spared Noah, who was a herald of righteousness. And then he gets to Sodom and Gomorrah. He said he turned the cities to ashes. But verse 7, And if he rescued righteous Lot, who was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and how to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. So here, another form of temptation or trial, where we're starting to see the blending of the two, is feeling distraught, feeling, what was, Lot, what was the word for Lot? He was tormented in his soul. Some translations say he was vexed. We would say he was really stressed out because of the city that he lived in, because of the evil that surrounded him. That's a form of temptation. And lastly, it's simply barriers in life that make life more difficult for us. Things that make us feel like we're facing a difficulty, we're facing a roadblock in the way. This can be, my health isn't what I want it to be. I don't have the sense of security that I want. I feel anxious. I feel like this life that I've built for myself, it, it's all at risk. It could all come crashing down. I feel I'm mistreated by people in the world, maybe people close to me. I feel like I'm alone. I feel like I'm unappreciated. People die. That's a trial. People let us down. Tragedy and disaster strikes, and there's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can do to prevent those things from happening. And it seems like good people suffer, good people befall those disasters just as much as, as the wicked. 
And all of these things are barriers in our life that make it seem more difficult. And the reality is that those trials, those trials can be temptations too, because those are moments that make us susceptible, that make us doubt, and that could make us more likely to maybe give some attention to these other forms of temptation, the, the world telling us we can fix your problems, we can make you feel better about all this, or, or even more direct encouragement, you know, why, why listen to God when he's forsaken you in this way? These are all temptations and trials, all different forms that it can take. And also from this verse in 1 Corinthians 10, it's common to man. It's certain, I would say. And so you think, well, that's not a very encouraging message. That's not a very encouraging thought, that these trials are going to be certain, that this temptation is going to be certain. But now we get to the rest of the verse. What does God do with our temptation? He forms and provides the way of escape. And this was the point that Brace brought out, that it is not on us to think, how am I going to be strong enough to get out of this? It's how am I going to utilize the path that God has carved out for me? God has laid out a road that whether it's a trial, a barrier in our life, or whether it's a force encouraging us to sin, God has a path open to us that we can escape. And so we're going to talk about that path for the rest of this evening. The first way of escape, I would say, I arranged in my notes, is avoidance. And this this is probably one of the most direct things we think about when we hear a lesson taught about temptation, uh, is don't sin. You know, that's kind of the, the simplified, boiled-down version of it all. As followers of God, we must resist calls to sin, no matter how disguised they might be. Turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, really, I was struggling to pick what book out of Proverbs to look here because... Solomon, adopting the voice of a father, speaking to his son, he's trying to give his son advice. He's trying to tell his son, make good choices. Aaron talked about choices for us this evening. Uh, so it's a book of, of wisdom and trying, trying as hard as a parent can to encourage a child to make good choices. I had a coach uh, in my high school years, and he had a phrase, don't do dumb things. That was his boiling down of the book of Proverbs. But looking in Proverbs chapter 1, starting in verse 10, there's some really heinous characters here. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive. And whole, like those who go down to the pit, we shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. And we might read that verse and say, well, that's kind of goofy. You know, that doesn't happen in real life. But I would encourage us all to not, I would warn us, do not uh, scoff at the warnings of Proverbs. Do not scoff at the possibility that there can be people as direct as this in our lives, but Further still, I think the language of Proverbs, you know, you could call it poetic language, you could say it's proverbial language, um, but it's, it's meant to have meaning to us, and it's meant to reveal something to us, and that is, Proverbs is peeling back what is usually disguised in the world. The world will try to cover up the, the real intent of sin and call it something that it's not. But what Proverbs does, and what this warning does, is to show us just how destructive and just how heinous it sounds when you peel back the veil. Sins often are made to sound appealing, and even they're made to sound like they have a semblance of reason. Think about some of these. What are ways, what's something that makes you feel proud? There's, there's things that make us feel proud in our lives, but how can our pride be a veil or a disguise for sin, something that we're proud of? The world would say, it's fine to be proud. What about something that makes you feel loved? Or appreciate it. You say, this, this person that I find comfort with, you know, I, I feel loved and appreciated by this person even though, you know, they're not, they're not my spouse. But the world would say, that's a good thing. What do you find exciting? What do you find fun? The world will try to disguise sin as recreation, harmless. What's well, something that comforts you? What are the things that soothe you? What makes you feel like you belong? 
one of the most key aspects of this crowd. They're comrades. These guys are buddies. They say, come on, let's do this together. We're, we're all going to get rich. We're all going to share our purse. You get an even cut. We're all going to treat each other fairly. It's going to be great. It's going to be a really fun time. And, you know, when we look at this list of questions about what are the things that appeal to us in our lives, the answers to these questions don't have to be wrong things. They don't have to be evil things in themselves. But what we have to understand is that we need to, we need to look into ourselves and ask ourselves, are my answers to these questions, are they ways that I know God has condoned their use? Do I answer these questions in ways that I know that God has approved of, or am I looking for something that the world wants me to approve of? Am I more at home in the community bar or community club than I am among brethren? Am I quicker to share news of a recent purchase that I made, maybe a big purchase that I made, than sharing the last thing I read in my daily Bible reading or studied in Bible class? There's often times where it seems harmless, and it feels harmless, but we might realize that we would rather substitute something that the world has to offer instead of something that God has to offer in ways that satisfy all of these needs. God provides us things in this life that meet all of these needs and intends for us to live our lives in a way that we can have these satisfied. God has that for us. He has methods to do that for us that are, that are within his plan, that are within his will. Sin is always looking to satisfy a need. Nobody goes out looking to do evil. People go out looking to fill one of these voids that they want to have. And the warning in Proverbs, the warning that we need to take to heart is, peel back the veil, realize what is actually being sold to you, offered to you, and flee. Avoid it. Literally run away. We talk about sometimes, you may have heard lessons before talking about, you know, put up barriers so that it's hard to even get close to those things. I think there's value to that. All of this takes an immense effort to know ourselves, to understand ourselves. It really takes an effort to introspect and to, to understand what motivates me, what do I enjoy, what makes me feel good. Because once we understand that about ourselves, then we know where our warnings lie. We know where our weak points are. It's important to understand ourselves. But avoidance has its limits. We talked about trials, right? Disasters happen. I can't set up a barrier in my life to stop an earthquake from swallowing my house whole. Now I can live in southern Indiana where there's no big fault lines that would likely do that. But you get the point. There's, there's ways that we can't avoid this. Barriers only go so far. So what do we do now? We, we understand avoiding where possible, but sometimes it's not. Well, God still provides the way of escape. One more point I wanted to, to make under this one while we're talking about avoidance is life is going to contain things that we can't avoid, but we don't know what God has spared us from already. And if we start to think about that, how many things has God completely diverted us away from that we didn't even know we were about to run into? And that's another way in which God provides this way of escape, sometimes without us even knowing or realizing. I would encourage all of you to take some time to think about how you can thank God for helping you avoid the things you didn't even know were nearly in your path. Next point we wanted to look at is, okay, so we've tried avoidance, but that doesn't always work. The next way of escape I would propose is endurance. Because we have to face the reality that exercising caution and putting up barriers for ourselves is not always going to work. The reality is that we can't protect ourselves against every possible temptation. And at some point, we have to stop relying on safety nets and sheltering ourselves, and we have to rely on other things, a learned self-control, a learned discipline in ourselves, bringing ourselves under subjection with God's help. This is the next step for us. I thought of this statement. I meant to bold it. There is no wall we can put up for ourselves that our soul set on sin cannot scale. There is no barrier that we can make for ourselves that we don't also have the capacity to override. So believing that simply hiding from sin or making sure that I just don't accidentally get close to it, it's not 
100% guarantee. There needs to be more in our arsenal and more in our toolbox than just that. And I believe that there's other paths of escape. There's more to the way of escape that God gives us, which is through temptation and trial. So let's talk about that a little bit. I believe that sometimes God's plan for our escape is giving us the strength to bear through that trial. In a sense, I think we should want to bear through temptations and trials because in doing so, we're actually gaining the strength and the, the refining that we need. You ever see those things that you put a baby in? I know, I'm thinking about babies right now. Those things that you put a baby in where they're suspended and they can kind of kick their little legs and scoot around the room. Have you ever seen an adult in one of those? No, that would be ridiculous to see because adults have learned to walk. Adults have learned to not bump their heads on the corners of the coffee table, which you didn't replace, even though it had sharp right angle corners. So now you got a 3D printed little foam thing so that they don't bump their little heads. You don't see adults using those little walker toys because it's expected that discipline and self-control are learned experiences. They help us grow. Otherwise, if we never experience that, if we never go through that trial, if we never make our way through a temptation, then we're vulnerable because Satan targets the untested and Satan targets the privileged. Look at Job chapter 1 in verse 9. The story of Job um, is, is so unique in Scripture because it lifts, it gives us a peek behind the camera. You know, we can see what's going on from from God's perspective and from Satan's perspective, which is odd to think about. But in Job chapter 1, we won't read the whole challenge, but Satan says, I've been walking around, you know, I've been looking at people, and God says, have you considered Job? There's no one like him on earth. He's upright, he's blameless, he fears God, and he turns away from evil. And in verse 9, Satan answered the Lord and said, does, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him? and his house, and all that he has on every side. You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand, and touch all that he has. He will curse you to your face. And God said, okay, you're on. Satan knew that Job was privileged. And Job was. Being blessed by God is a privilege. And Satan knew, or Satan believed, that Job was untested, that Job hadn't had the real struggles of life applied to him. So he decided to start pushing. What are the ways in which we are privileged? What are the ways in which we haven't been tested yet? And I know when we start asking this question, it's easy to have the reaction of defensiveness and think, now hold on, you know, I've got troubles in life, I've been through things. Don't go calling me privileged. I'm not privileged. Just bear with me. Is growing up in the church privilege that Satan can exploit? What about having a family where all of your immediate family are believing Christians? We call that a blessing. All of these things that are privileges, we call them blessings. But is that something that Satan can try to exploit? I haven't had to deal with family not accepting my belief in God. Material wealth. We read about the rich young ruler this morning. Is material wealth Privilege? Not everyone has it, so yes. What about societal privilege? The fact that we have brethren, and this is true, folks, we have brethren who are more tried than other people in this world and in many ways are treated worse just because of who they are or just because of what they do or don't have. These privileges are real. I listed growing up in the church and family because I see those things in me. I see those things in me as these are areas that Satan will try to test. These are areas that Satan will say, he hasn't had it hard enough yet. He's had it too easy. I'm going to exploit those things. I'm going to target those things that haven't been tested yet. We need to be aware of that. And we need to be able to endure that. These things are necessary to go through. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. states, 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. That sounds like privilege. That's a huge privilege. And praise God for it. Verse 5. So he's talking about us who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God provides us a way of escape by guarding us through faith. That is God providing power to weather temptation. Picture temptation or the trial as a, a bramble of thorns in the pathway, and you need to go through it. And God's power and God's guarding here is like a, is like a snow plow that goes in front of you that can give you the strength to cut through those trials and those temptations. If you don't have that snow plow in front of you, if you don't have that power aiding you, then you're going to try to cut through thorns with your bare skin. And this verse is telling us that we can be assured of God's victory to help us endure through trials. So another way of escape, straight through. Next thing I wanted to focus on is our spiritual warfare. And this is somewhat tied to the idea of enduring trials, but there's a little different context here I want to look at. Let's think about the, the account of Jesus in the wilderness when Jesus is tempted. It's odd to think of God being tempted, but Jesus emptied himself. He became as a man, so he could experience temptation the way that we do. The, the urge to make a name for yourself, the urge to satisfy yourself. And have you ever asked yourself the question, why did Jesus talk to Satan? Why didn't, why didn't Jesus say, depart from me as soon as Satan showed up? Because remember, we talked about avoiding sin. Sometimes that's what those lessons tend to sound like, is just tell the, tell the temptation to go away. Tell Satan to go away. Why didn't Jesus just say, go away? Go away, Satan. He talked to him for, I believe in some of the accounts, that it indicates that Jesus conversed with Satan for a very long time. I don't think it was just a three-point conversation that we have recorded. Um, why not be like Joseph? You know, we, we always hold up Joseph as this prime example of, when there's temptation, when there's the opportunity to sin, run away. Drop whatever it is, run away. And I want to be clear here. I don't want to give the impression that I'm saying we shouldn't flee from sin. I don't want to, 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 uh, to give that impression. In fact, I, I noted down in my notes a few passages that specifically talk about this. 1 Corinthians 10.14 says, flee from idolatry. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee from sexual immorality. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee from youthful passions. So fleeing is part of this. Don't get me wrong. We already talked about that point. But now we're thinking about what Jesus did. He, he battled with Satan. He conversed with Satan. Why? Satan was coming to Jesus with reasons reasons why it was okay for Jesus to do what Satan wanted him to do. And in doing that, Jesus combated those reasons to sin. Satan will not be so kind to us. He wasn't kind to Jesus, and Satan is not going to give up so easily. If we say, depart from me, Satan doesn't have to listen to us. Why would Satan just agree to make it easy on us? Jesus did not sin in his conversing with Satan. He did not sin in his engaging with his talking points, but he countered the temptations. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 now. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 has some more information about this idea of combating. Beginning in verse 1, I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against someone who suspects us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power 
to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. In our spiritual warfare, avoidance and fleeing is not always enough. We have to have an offensive portion of our arsenal to complement the defensive and the evasive. In destroying arguments, the, the word there for arguments is reasonings or judgments. It's, it's people who have a reason to be hostile to our faith. And these high and lofty opinions, um, the King James Version, I believe, says every high thing or every lofty thing. That Greek word for high and lofty thing is actually a battle tower that they would put on wheels and wheel up to the city, and it's this huge wooden structure that they would attack from. So how are you going to tear down the battle tower that Satan is pushing up against our walls? We do so in defense of the knowledge of God. <clears throat> And this warfare requires our engaging with the enemy because we are going to be tempted to be ashamed of our faith. These are real things that people might say. When you're told that you have an archaic belief system that is demeaning to and subjugating of women, how are you going to combat that temptation? <laughs> they want you to be ashamed of your faith. They want you to be ashamed of what's written in this book. When someone says to you that you're condoning the harm that comes to children and young people, even the risk of suicide, because you don't think that they should be supported in the lifestyle that they're choosing. This is something people say about people of faith. You're okay with kids wanting to kill themselves because you won't condone their sin. You're giving money to a greedy tax haven of an institution that doesn't help the community. Why are you doing that? And if these things are making us a little uncomfortable, I'm, that's the point. I'm adopting this language and I'm telling you now that in these statements are assumptions, in these statements are assertions that need to be countered, that need to be combated. And if any of the things that I said in the voice of someone who is a critic of Christianity, if you hear that and think, I would be scared if someone said that to me, then we need to prepare ourselves. We need to work to be prepared to tear down those battle towers. In the past, I've, I've had a hard time with this notion of spiritual warfare in the past, and I think it's because I often don't like the mixing of what I would call militancy and faith, but in looking at these passages, I think I came to a, a renewed realization that there is a real need for courage in spiritual warfare. And it's not hostile toward people, and we're not chasing windmills by attacking something that isn't real, or a belief that someone doesn't really hold to. But it takes care. Paul is saying in this passage in, in 2 Corinthians 10, in our confidence in the spiritual warfare, Paul's saying we cannot be too sure that God is right. We cannot be too sure that God is on our side. And the way of escape from temptation, the way of escape from these trials that we might face, these reasons to sin, or these reasons to reject God, may require us to better handle the truth. And it has to teach us to better handle the truth. And there's a right way to do this. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to pose another example, another hypothetical. It's not befitting when talking to, for instance, a young woman who's had an abortion by calling her a baby murderer and shaming her because she does not believe that of herself. You're attacking a belief that she doesn't have. And when we attack beliefs that people don't have, we're attacking a straw man, we're charging windmills, to use the Don Quixote example, then we're putting people off. We're hurting them. They won't listen. But instead, if we acknowledge what she has been convinced of, what she currently believes, and show her in the ways in which God values her life and all lives, there's a right way to do this. There's a right way to be combative. I'm not telling you today that you need to go out and start yelling at people in the street. I'm not telling you that you need to go out and start making people just feel bad about themselves and not do anything about it. 
It takes tact, it takes care, but it takes practice. We have to destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. The last subject I wanted to cover in the way of escape that God provides is the hardest one. These have gotten harder as we've gone on. We think avoiding sin is hard, and, and the reality is that some of, this, some of this gets really tough. But this one especially is what to do when we have succumbed to temptation. What to do when we have succumbed to the trial, or we believe that the trial has beaten us. The hardest thing to do is often the thing that we avoid the most. But the thing we avoid the most may just be our path of escape. 2 Timothy chapter 2 has a, an idea that I wanted us to think about. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 20. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. We'll pause there for a bit. Did you catch what he says about these vessels? You're not born a vessel of gold. Everyone who cleanses himself from the dishonorable can become a vessel for honorable use. What does this say to us? That the way out of the dishonorable is cleansing, and that it's possible. It's possible to overcome those things. Consider the next passage. We actually referenced this a bit ago. Verse 22, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on God from a pure heart, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. There's that enduring. And correcting his opponents with gentleness. There's what we just talked about. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. 2 Timothy 2 here is a reminder that there is always an opportunity to confront our sins and to be cleansed. We can't escape. Sin and the guilt we feel over sin are captors. They affect our well-being. They affect our confidence. They affect our ability to operate and feel like we're worth anything. We frequently will refer to Psalms chapter 32 in verses 1 through 6 there. I'm not being very conscious of the time, but we're going to turn there and read that because it's God's word, right? It's worth our time. Psalm 32, beginning in verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and, who, and, <clears throat> and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for night and day your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sins to you. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. I, I'm mindful of a metaphor that uh, Grant Byers used in Invitations. And uh, this one stuck in my mind. He said that sin is a jail cell, but the door is open. And the door doesn't close until it's too late for us, until our life ends. And I believe that's, that's entirely true. Satan is not powerful enough to hold us against our will. He's not powerful enough to hold us against our will. In Luke chapter 15, the son that was lost returned to the father by admitting his wrongdoing. He included that in his plan. He came to his senses in doing so. And, and this lesson of, of confronting our sin and turning again is a lesson that sometimes we have to learn and we have to relearn. 
And I want to tell you that if you think that you're sparing yourself by not doing the hard thing, it feels worse. Even if you try to distract yourself and delight yourself in other things so you don't think about your guilt or you don't think about what you're leaving unaddressed, you can't even enjoy those things. Day and night your, heavy was, your hand was heavy upon me. My bones wasted away. I want to keep my bones. 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1 is a picture of this denial, this inability or unwillingness to admit that we need to confess, that we need to acknowledge our sin to God. In verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship in him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. <clears throat> We tell ourselves all kinds of things to stay in denial. Denial keeps us trapped, but the truth will set us free. We might say, people won't be able to look at me the same way. Maybe some, if they're of poor character. But very likely, you're projecting your own feelings of yourself onto those people. Do you think about other people that way when they confess their wrongdoings? Is that how you view others when they make mistakes? The reality is that we're often far too harsh on ourselves, and we assume that everybody else is going to be far too harsh on us. But try to do the uncomfortable thing and realize that people's reactions may not be as bad as you think. People's ability and capacity to forgive can go further than you think. Progress requires that we face the uncomfortable things about ourselves that we would rather avoid. So as we prepare to close up for this evening, just to, to go over a little bit to remind us of a few things. Temptation and trial can take a lot of forms. To understand what they are, we have to understand what it is we like, what it is that motivates us. And don't think that the way of escape always means running away. And don't think that the way of escape always means you're going to get a nice, easy detour that's paved and shiny and clean and new. Sometimes the way of escape is going to feel like the most difficult choice and we're going to try to tell ourselves that it's the worst choice. That's the last thing I want to do, is, is face that about myself. But God has provided it for us, and God has provided cleansing so that there is no trial and no temptation, even if it overtakes us, that can overwhelm us. So don't think that God's way of escape is going to feel like the easy way. But know this, that God's way of escape, it is lasting God's way of escape is immensely satisfying, more so than the world will try to sell us. God's way of escape will not disappoint us. It will not leave us wanting more. And the last thing to remember is that all of this is a process. And so taking steps, even if it's a little at a time, you start to see the results of that process, and it helps you grow your faith. It helps your faith be tested, and you're more assured of it. Trust God that he wants the very best outcome for you, as all of us do. Do I need to keep clicking this? Oh, that's the wrong button. I believe that's right. If there's anyone here tonight who we can assist in any way, we'd love to be able to do so. We're all faced with these same trials, these same temptations, and you know, as we discussed, it has to do with, with what it is we like. It has to do with what it is that motivates us. So you've heard it said before, and it's true, that it's not always the same for every person. But we can all relate to the fact that we all have trials. We can all relate to the fact that we have things that, that tempt us. We have things that make us feel like we're surrounded by wrongdoing. But there is hope. There is hope for all of us. And that hope is in the cleansing. Become a vessel of gold, silver. Become a vessel of honor by being cleansed from the dishonor. 
and be prepared to avoid those things that cause us trouble, to endure through the things that, that make life difficult for us, and to be willing to go into combat. And if we feel unprepared, if we feel untrained, well, that's something that God is showing us that we need to learn more about. God is showing us that we need to work on. If we can encourage you or assist you in any way, maybe it's in becoming a Christian for the first time, we'd love to help you while we stand and while we sing.